this video, I'm going to be talking about the GMAT exam pattern. Now, you might have heard that GMAT has multiple sections. What are these sections? What do they test us on? And how do we really prepare for these sections? That's what this video is going to be about. So let's take a look at the GMAT exam structure. So you're going to be getting four sections on the GMAT. We will look at each one of them one by one. The first section that you have is called Analytical Writing Ability or AWA. What you will be given is you will be given a topic to write on. Uh, there will be a particular case and you need to evaluate that case. You need to say why that particular scenario has some issues with it. Now, you don't need to worry. All the possible AWA topics that can be asked on the GMAT are already published. What GMAT is really trying to see is whether you have a particular approach, a structure to these essays. And what we will be providing you in the course is a template. And all you need to do is follow the template and uh, write your essays based on that. Once in the practice, if you are writing an AWA essays, you can email it to us and our mentors will have a look at it and give you very specific feedback in terms of the language, in terms of the content, in terms of the overall construction and structure as well, so that you are able to improve on it. The second section that you have is called Integrated Reasoning or IR. Now, IR is nothing but data interpretation and uh, you will be given data in various forms. It could be text, it could be numbers, it could be pie charts, graphs, tables, and you'll be asked a variety of different types of questions based on this. All of this will be provided to you when you look at the integrated reasoning section in the course. So we will go through all the question types. We will tell you how to handle each one. Now, the point over here is you don't need to really worry about AWA and IR. All that you are expected is you are expected to score a minimum score. AWA is out of a scale of 0 to 6 and integrated reasoning is on a scale of 0 to 8. And if you get, let's say, a 5 in IR or a 5 in AWA, which is considered to be the minimum, uh, you should do well on the GMAT. You don't need to really worry. Your actual 800 score will not depend on AWA or IR. But what they will depend on is your performance in the quant and the verbal sections of the test. So let's look at the quant section. So the quant section, you will get 31 questions, which you will have to answer in 62 minutes. That gives you two minutes per question. And uh, these could be questions in data sufficiency or problem solving. Data sufficiency, you will be given some statements and you need to answer whether the statements provided are enough in order to answer the question that is given to you. In the case of problem solving, you actually will solve the question and there are five answers. You need to pick the answer that is right. When it comes to verbal, you have a total of 36 questions, which will be split uh, uh, about 13 to 14 questions for reading comprehension, about 12 to 13 questions for sentence correction, and about 9 to 10 questions for critical reasoning. So totally, you will have about 65 minutes to answer these 36 questions, which means roughly you get about 108, 109 seconds per question on verbal. Now, there are three ways in which you can attempt the GMAT. You can either start by taking AWA and IR as your first section, then proceed on to quant and then go on to verbal. But there are also other options available. You can start with verbal, go on to quant and then continue with IR and AWA. There is a third option where you start with quant, go to verbal and then get to IR and AWA. Now, which of these three approaches is the best which of the three section selection should one choose? Well, these are all things that we will get into a little bit more detail when you start taking actual mock tests and we will have someone who can look at what I have been your performance across uh, you know, various section starts. And based on that, we could probably arrive at what could be the best section selection order for you. You don't need to really uh, bother. I have had students who have scored very high 
uh, in each of these section selection orders. So you don't need to really uh, think that, you know, if I pick one particular order, I may end up scoring low. Uh, it depends on your comfort level. Are you someone who's strong in quant? Do you want to really start off with your best section? In which case, the second uh, order, which is starting with quant and then going on to verbal, uh, could be a good way because you start off the test with a lot of confidence. Uh, on the other hand, I've also had students who have said, well, let me start off with verbal because that's the section where I need to be at the top of my game and then I can, you know, figure out how to do quant and the other sections. There have been some people who have actually stuck to the first sequence and they say, well, let me get a little bit of my brain buzzing. Let me get a momentum by solving uh, AW and IR before I get into quant and verbal. So there are pros and cons of each of these orders. Uh, it's something that you will eventually uh, have to pick before the day of your GMAT. The GMAT itself can be taken either at home or at a test center close to you. Now, what are the factors or what are the differences between these two types of tests or these two ways in which you can take the test? Right now, there is very little to differentiate both these types of uh, tests, like whether you take it at home or at the test center, largely the same. But there are some factors that you need to consider. The first factor that you need to consider is availability of test spots at a center that is close to you. Many of these test centers can get booked a few months in advance and it may be hard for you to actually pick a slot. Whereas if you were to take it from home, uh, you should be able to book a test uh, within 24 to 48 hours. You will be able to get an open slot and take it at that time. Uh, the other thing that you need to look at is, uh, you know, uh, the way the proctors work. Now, when you go to a test center, the proctor is sitting outside and uh, you can actually call the proctor at any time and he can help you. In the case of an online test, before the test starts, the proctor will want access to your laptop to ensure that, you know, everything is uh, as per, uh, that there is no way in which there could be potential uh, scope of cheating on the exam. Uh, they may want to have a pan out, you know, to your whole room uh, to see if everything is fine. Uh, and once all is okay, your test at home will start. So the way the proctor interacts is going to be different. Um, there is one more factor that you need to consider uh, and that is the scratch pad that you get. So on the test center, you will be given a scratch pad uh, and you will be given a marker pen. So you cannot do your rough work over there. In case you end up running out of the scratch pad, you just need to raise your hand. The proctor will come in and replenish it. In the case of uh, taking it at uh, home, there are two ways in which you can do your rough work. One is there is a virtual whiteboard provided to you uh, in the exam screen itself. So you can do some calculations online. But what most students find more convenient is actually having a physical whiteboard. So there are some specifications that are detailed. We will be letting you uh, know about it. But those uh, specs is what you require in a physical whiteboard. You can actually keep that whiteboard with a pen and you can solve uh, as you are you know, attempting the questions. So that is one other difference in both. Uh, in terms of just the psychology of going to a test center, I've had some students who have come and said, I'm more comfortable when I'm sitting at a test center because, you know, it's not at home. I have that focus to take the GMAT. Whereas there have been other students who have said, taking it at home just makes me more comfortable so that I can focus on the test. There is really no right or wrong thing over here. It really depends on your personal situation. Now, uh, you know, since we have been working from home for quite some time now, uh, most people have a setup at home where they have uninterrupted power supply, where they have a stable Wi-Fi connection. So in case you have a home office setup, uh, then taking it at home could obviously be um, a lot easier. But in case you are not used to it, in case you are not very sure if your internet is going to go off uh, or your power is going to go off or if someone is going to disturb you, the best would be for you to pick a test center. Again, I'm going to remind you that at the end of the day, uh, which format you take should not really matter to a large extent on your final GMAT score. In the next video, we will be getting a little bit deeper 
into understanding how GMAT scoring actually happens.